It is so good to see you guys. Doug Antcliffe came up to me just a few minutes ago and said, hey, bloke, and that was good. So I want to welcome all the blokes and Sheilas. It was so good to see the Waynes and the Lassies up here singing a few minutes ago. So that was fun. And some of you are turning to one of the other ones saying, what is he doing? I don't know what he's saying. And that's okay. What you should be saying is, Adenikai. Adenikin, that means I don't know. So, and you might be also saying, your bum's out the windy. That means you're not making any sense. So, I just wanted to give you a little taste of what we have felt in the 15 months since we left here. Uh, just a little over 15 months ago, uh, my name is Reagan Eddins, by the way, in case you're new here. Uh, that was my wife, Gracie, that was singing just a moment ago. And uh, just a little over 15 months ago, we were sent out by First Baptist Church Roosevelt to Scotland, to uh, Glasgow is where we live. We are with a ministry called 20 Schemes, and that is a ministry that seeks to plant and revitalize churches in the schemes of Scotland. A scheme is a deprived neighborhood, and there are many of them all throughout Scotland. So we have been in Glasgow. We are at a church called Hope Community Church, Barlanark. Barlanark is a scheme on the east end of Glasgow with about 4,000 folks, and we have been there ministering in that church and sharing the gospel with our neighbors and anybody else that we can and it's just been a wonderful time there. So it's good to see you. It's really good to be back and see a lot of familiar faces and special friends. So thank you for letting us come. We thought it was going to be easy going to an English-speaking country, but as you've heard already, there is a huge, uh, just a, a vast um, catalog of Scottish slang. And it is an absolute riot hearing them speak. It's pure bari. That means it's brilliant. And as uh, John said earlier, I do hope that you can stay afterwards for the delicious scran we're going to be eating in the fellowship hall. You might say, scran, don't call what I brought scran, but that, that means it's good food. So I hope that you can stay. And uh, we brought some mugs, um, coffee mugs. There's some on this back table here and also some in the fellowship hall. Uh, some coffee mugs that have a little picture of John Knox, the great Scottish reformer. So please take those home. And as you drink your coffee out of that, as you have a cuppa, um, pray for us. Pray for 20 Schemes. Pray for Scotland. Pray for churches to be revitalized and planted in the schemes of Scotland so that the gospel can go forth, so that the word can be preached, so that lives can be transformed. Because that's the only way. That's the only hope for the schemes of Scotland. There's tons of government money flowing into the schemes of Scotland, and yet there's no change because the gospel is the only thing that changes lives. So uh, we're learning how to speak. We are trying to fit in. I may not sound like them, but I'm trying to use these words and phrases and Scottish slang and, and do that. I'm also trying to be a good citizen uh, in the broadest sense. I'm not, we're not citizens of Scotland yet. We're still citizens of the USA, but hopefully in about five years, we can at least have a dual citizenship. But in the broadest sense, as an inhabitant of Glasgow, we're trying to be good citizens. We're driving on the correct side of the road. I don't say the right side of the road because we're not on the right side of the road. We're on the left side of the road. And so we're trying to do those things uh, and uh, not turn left on a red. You got to think opposite. It's so instead of turning right on a red, over there you turn left on a red, and they don't let you do that. That's been very difficult to adjust to. Um, we're uh, doing those things. Before we went over to 20 Schemes, uh, we had a couple of conversations with them because apparently they have this crazy idea that Americans have a hard time obeying Scottish leaders or UK leaders, queens and kings. I don't know what would make them think that uh, Americans would uh, have a, a problem obeying them, but uh, I assured them, I said, do not worry. I have this, uh, this example in my life of how to be totally compliant with tyrannical government officials and magistrates. His name is Jim Baxa, and uh, he's, he's, he showed me how. And don't you worry. 
I hesitated to say that in public because when we go through passport control, red flags might go off on Wednesday just because of mentioning his name. No, I'm just joking. I'm joking. Seriously, though, my desire, our desire is to be good citizens. Because you, as you know, the privilege of living in Scotland or the privilege of living in the USA, it is a privilege. And citizenship comes with certain responsibilities. Citizenship comes with certain duties. And I bring this up because it's the key theme of our passage today. In fact, Francisco brought up the same thing uh, two weeks ago. On Easter Sunday, he was in Philippians 3, 20 and 21. We're going to be in Philippians 1. And we're going to look at this theme of our citizenship is in heaven. This is like a prequel to what Pastor Francisco talked about two weeks ago. But Paul is going to challenge the Philippian Christians to live as citizens of heaven. Why would he use this concept of citizenship with the Philippians? He did it because he knew that citizenship was near and dear to the heart of every Philippian, believer or unbeliever. And this is illustrated in Acts chapter 16. You don't have to turn there, but just to remind you, in Acts chapter 16, what great and dramatic chapter, we learned that Philippi was a Roman colony. That meant it had the same legal status as cities in Italy. Citizens of Philippi were Roman citizens, exempt from paying certain taxes and not subject to the authority of the provincial government. We know from looking back at Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas were called there by a vision from God to go to Philippi, that key city in Macedonia. And when they arrived there, there apparently was not a synagogue. They would always go to the synagogue first, but there apparently was not one. So they went out beside the river to meet with any Jews or god fears that might be there. And that's where they met a certain na- lady named Lydia. And they preached the gospel to her. And the, the text says that God opened her heart. God's sovereign grace. She was saved. And then daily, Paul and Silas would also go back to that same place to pray. But every single day, a demoniac slave girl would follow them, crying out, these are men of the Most High. And finally, after a number of days, Paul got annoyed, the text says, and told that demon to leave that girl. And it did. The girl was delivered from that demon. And immediately her employees were, employers were very upset with what happened because she had been very profitable because the demon that was in her allowed her to tell the future. So with their... Uh, With their cash gone, they raised up the city magistrates and dragged Paul and Silas into the marketplace where they were, their robes were torn off them and they were beaten with rods, Paul and Silas, without a trial, right in the city square. And then they were thrown into the prison, not only the prison, the deepest, darkest part of that prison. But you know the dramatic story about midnight as they were singing and praising God, an earthquake came, the doors were broken open and but they didn't flee out. The Philippian jailer came in about to kill himself. And then Paul said, we are all here. Don't do that. He was saved. So this church is planted right then uh, with Lydia and with the Philippian jailer and their whole households. But the very next morning, um, Acts 16 tells us that when day came, the chief magistrates sent their policemen saying, release those men. And the jailer reported these words to Paul, saying, The chief magistrate has sent to release you. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. But Paul said, No, no, no. We're not going to go right now because we are Roman citizens. And immediately the magistrates were afraid because citizenship of Rome brought with it many privileges, but also responsibilities and duties. And those magistrates had failed in their duties. They had beaten, stripped, and thrown in prison Roman citizens, Paul and Silas. They ended up uh, eventually leaving Philippi, but I say that just to let you know and also to show you that this was a big deal. Philippians, the Philippians and those in that church would have known exactly what Paul was saying when he calls on them to live as citizens of heaven. 
because citizenship in Rome brought certain rights and privileges, but also responsibilities and duties. So Paul uses this theme to point out to them how much more does heavenly citizenship uh, uh, say to us? What does that do? What does that tell us about our responsibilities and our duties? With that in mind, are you in Philippians chapter 1? If you're not there, turn to Philippians chapter 1. We're going to look at 27 through 30. Philippians 1, 27 through 30. To do like we always do, let's read the Word of God, let's pray, and then let's go through this text. Philippians 1, verse 27. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, in no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you, and that too from God. For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time that we get to come to your word to look at this theme of citizenship. We thank you so much that by your grace, grace alone, that we are citizens of heaven, that we are your children adopted into your family. Thank you so much for your word. Lord, speak to us. Show us what it means to be citizens of heaven. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Philippians 1 verse 27, Paul starts off with this word only, only. Other translations might say just one thing. There's one essential thing that Paul wanted to say to the Philippian church that he wanted them to understand. And there is one essential thing that we are to do as well. What was it? Only conduct yourselves in a manner. Stop right there. Conduct yourselves in a manner. That could also be translated as conduct yourselves as a citizen. Just a couple weeks ago, as Francisco was preaching on Easter Sunday, he was looking at Philippians 3, verse 20 and 21, where Paul uses this same thing, except in Philippians 3, verse 20, he uses the noun version of this word. Today in our text, it's the verb, and it's the key thought of the passage. But in Philippians 3, 20, Paul said, for our citizenship is in heaven. We are citizens of heaven. We have been called to be citizens of heaven. This is the key verb in the passage, and it's also the key thought. And what does that mean? Only conduct yourselves in a manner, keep going, in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. You see, we heard the gospel. We believe the gospel. And we are now called to live worthy of the gospel. There had been a time in our life when we had not heard the gospel, or maybe we had heard it and we had not believed in the gospel. Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 2 that it was at that point when we were dead in our trespasses and sins. We were sons of disobedience. We were slaves of sin and slaves of unrighteousness. But then right in the middle of that text is such a great word, but God. But God, because of his love for us, because of his mercy, regenerated us, made us alive. We were born again because we heard the gospel. We heard the good news that Jesus came, that he lived a perfect life, and that he died on the cross, paying the penalty for our sins. He was buried and he rose again the third day. And we heard that good news And we repented and we believed in the gospel. And again, I would even stop right now and say, if you are here today and you've never believed the gospel, if you've never turned from your sin to follow Christ, talk to someone afterwards. Turn to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Believe in him. Trust in him alone for your salvation. We we're saved by God's glorious grace. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. He gave us this amazing gift of salvation. And now we see him here 
uh, through the Apostle Paul, calling us to live in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. We have been gloriously saved. Now what are we called to do? We are called to live it, to live in the gospel. We teach the gospel. We need to live like it. That is the main theme that Paul is trying to get across in this passage. The Philippians, they also had extra accountability. They had an extra motivation, and that's what we see in the rest of this verse, because Paul said, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you, that you, that will, I will hear about what's, what's going on in your life. And you see that if we were to look at the very next chapter, we would see that Paul is just about to send Timothy to Philippi so that he can do this very thing, so that he can hear about what Timothy has to say when he comes back. And we too have tremendous motivation. We too have tremendous accountability. Because as we learned, as you learned two weeks ago, on this same theme of citizenship in heaven, Jesus is coming back. He is coming back. And we have that as motivation. We have that as accountability. He is coming. Someone much greater than Paul or Timothy is coming. First, Timothy, First Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17 says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And we're going to be with him. He's coming back, and we will be with him. We are citizens of heaven. So that is our accountability and our motivation. This is all introduction. How do we do that? How do we live as citizens of heaven? How do we live in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ? That is what Paul is going to tell us as we go through this passage. We're going to have four points. The first one being, we do it by standing firm. It's the very first thing we see there as we go through this first verse. Paul says, whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear that you are standing firm. That's the first way that we live as a citizen of heaven or as we, we live in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ by standing firm. These words, standing firm, this is military language. This is soldier talk. This is a commanding officer telling his soldier to stand firm, stay in your foxhole, hold the line, do not leave your post, no matter how severe the attack is. What are we standing firm against? What are we guarding? What are we protecting through the power of God? Well, let's see how you, Paul uses this, these words elsewhere is to stand firm. In 1 Corinthians 16, 13, Paul says, Be alert. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. So we are to stand firm in the faith. In Galatians 5, 1, Paul says, Stand firm. And there the context is in regard to the truth of justification by faith. We're to stand firm in the faith, in the truth of justification by faith. In 2 Thessalonians 2.15, Paul writes, Stand firm and hold to the traditions you were taught through what we said or through what we wrote. In 1 Thessalonians 3.8, Paul says, Stand firm in the Lord. So what are we to stand firm in? We're to stand firm in the truth from the Lord. We are to be standing firm in the Word of God, truth from the Lord wasn't just Paul who said this. John also said this. It's a little letter we rarely turn to, but it's 2 John. And if you want to go there, we're going to look at a couple of verses in 2 John to reemphasize this point. Uh, John in 2 John verse 1 says this, The elder to the chosen lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth, for the sake of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace and mercy be with, be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Son of the Father in truth and love. I was very glad to find some of you, some of your children, walking in the truth. Let's get very practical about how we can stand firm, how we can stand firm in the truth. First of all, we can stand firm in the truth by reading it. He says right there, you know the truth. John was happy because they knew the truth. 
We need to know the truth. We're all very blessed to be in good churches. Hope Community Church Barlonic in Scotland, First Baptist Church Roosevelt. We're in good Bible-believing, gospel-preaching churches. I even heard that here at Roosevelt, you guys are going through the book of Leviticus on Wednesday night. That's amazing. That, is, that, that shows a serious commitment to the Word of God. That is awesome. But friends, beloved, Sunday morning, Wednesday evening, that's not enough. We need to be in the Word constantly, daily. We need to be involved in Bible studies, personal Bible study, group Bible study. Um, I heard just this morning that the men's Bible study is about to finish up something. In Scotland, we call it blokes Bible study. But uh, we need to be in those. Every chance we get to be in a men's Bible study, a women's Bible study, a youth Bible study, we need to do that. You want more Bible study? Just ask. Ask Pastor Francisco. Ask Pastor John, Brent, Michael Slaughter, anybody. Ask them. They'll get somebody with you to do more Bible study. We need to be in the Word. We need to know the Word of God. Second, as we saw right there in that passage, we need to uh, walk in the truth. We need to walk in the truth. We need to obey it. We need to know it, but it doesn't stop there. We need to walk in the truth. We need to obey it. Third, we need to speak the truth. It says he's so happy that people are speaking the truth. Uh, Ephesians 4.15, Paul says, speak the truth in love. Beloved, we have to open our mouths. We have to speak the truth. We do it in love, but we have to speak it. Finally, we must teach the truth. 2 Timothy 2.2 says, These things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will, be, who will also teach it to others. This verse is not just for pastors. It's for everyone. Certainly it is for pastors. I'm so thankful for men like Pastor Francisco who bring in younger men, younger pastors, and teach them and uh, lead them what it looks like to be a faithful pastor. But this is not just for pastors. This is for everyone. Paul told the Philippian church to stand firm. We must stand firm in the truth of God's word. That's the first thing. The next thing that we are to do is we are to be unified. Right after he says, stand firm, he does, says, stand firm in one spirit with one mind. In one spirit with one mind. That speaks of the experience of unity, of harmony, of interdependence, being in one accord. That means that we have one common attitude, one common mind, a community spirit. And this is illustrated as you look through the book of Acts. If you remember early on in the book of Acts, in chapter 2 and chapter 4, that young church, that young believing church, as many were getting saved, they were selling all that they had and they were helping one another. They were in one accord. They were doing everything in one spirit, Acts 2 and Acts 4. Um, right before we left Roosevelt 15 months ago, we had determined that we needed to go back through the membership class. And we did that in the adult Sunday school class. We went, I think, three weeks that we spent going through membership and church membership and the importance of that. And we looked at 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and many other passages as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, in verse 12, it says this, For even as the body is one and yet has many members, and all the members um, of the body through the... Uh, Though there are many, they are all one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. We were reminded that we are not united by background. We're not united by culture or class. We're not. Some of us in this room come from many places. New Mexico, Washington State. Wisconsin, various places throughout Texas. At uh, Hope Community Church in Berlanic, it's much the same. We have people from Ireland, people from America. We have two families from my Nigeria, and we may not sound the same. We obviously don't. We've already discussed that. But we all have the same spirit. We all have believed 
in one Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. We are united by that spirit. We are united by belief in the person and work of Christ. Paul has so much more to say in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, but just to get to the point in verse 25, here's the point. So that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. This is so important. Division in the church is deadly. Paul was concerned about that with the church in Philippi. Uh, Just a a couple of pages back in Philippians chapter 4, he actually addresses two women. And these weren't just any women. These were pillars of the church. These were key women that had ministered alongside him. And Paul says in Philippians 4 verse 2, I urge Euodia, I urge Syntyche to live in harmony in the Lord. Why would he say that? The only reason he would say that is because they were not living in harmony in the Lord. There had become a disagreement and there was disunity there. How do we do that? Listen to Paul in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. Here is how we do this. This is how we live unified in the body and the church. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. Paul says, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That is how we do that, with humility, treating each other with love. We cannot allow disunity to come in, quarreling and fighting. We have to be humble, loving one another, as God has called us to do. That is how we live as good citizens of heaven. That is how we live in a manner worthy of the gospel. We stand firm. We are unified. Next, we are striving together. Third, we're striving together. He says at the end of verse uh, 27, right after he says, standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Striving together is an athletic word. It means to engage in an athletic competition with, with others, with teammates. It has the idea of teamwork. I just mentioned Yodia and Syntyche a minute ago because there had been disunity there. There was uh, disharmony there. But the very next verse says, Indeed, true companion, I ask you also to help these women who have shared in my struggle in the cause of the gospel together with Clement, also with the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Paul was calling on the church to come alongside these two women so that they could strive together for the gospel, for the faith of the gospel. We understand this idea of teamwork in athletics, do we not? It's been amazing to watch from afar, from the other side of the world, the Texas Tech men's basketball team. We've watched Coach Mark Adams take a group of guys who, I almost hesitate to say this, who are not supposed to be as good as they are, but, I mean, let's be honest, they're not the highest recruits, but he has taken this group of men and molded them into a team that play amazing offense and amazing defense, and he's taught them how to be, to work as a team, and they've done amazing things. You've probably heard how crazy European soccer is. I'm here to tell you, it's true. They are fanatical about their soccer. There are two really good teams in the Scottish Premier Football League. They are the Rangers and Celtic. They're both in Glasgow. And when we first arrived, I kind of wanted to be a Rangers fan. I mean, it just makes sense. Rangers, Texas Rangers, and I thought... I want to be a Rangers fan. So I asked Pastor Pete, is it okay if I'm a Rangers fan? And you know what he said? No, it's not. (laughs) I said, why not? He said, if you wear a Rangers shirt around the scheme, there's at least half the scheme will hate you. Really? Oh, yeah. (laughs) And we've seen that firsthand. I mean, they are fanatical about their football. He said, it's okay to support Motherwell Football Club. Motherwell never wins anything, so we support them. You'll be okay. Nobody's threatened by Motherwell, so that's who we support. 
We saw this craziness firsthand. Uh, Danny and I did as we went to one of the football games and we were a little bit scared. Well, I was scared. He wasn't too scared. Walking back uh, to our car afterwards, it, there was a huge police presence because there needed to be a huge police presence so that the different fans didn't brawl outside the stadium. Uh, when the Rangers and the Celtics play, when one team wins, fireworks go off for hours. We were warned right after we arrived in our, in our little uh, flat, our little apartment on Calvay Road. Uh, this Sunday afternoon, the Rangers and the Celtic, they're playing. Don't go around the corner to Calvay Crescent because there will be fights there. Just stay away from that area Sunday afternoon after the game. Okay. It's for real. That does happen. So I only bring that up because I believe that that gets at the idea that Paul is trying to communicate here in Philippians chapter 1. Oftentimes, oftentimes athletic events in Rome or the colonies like Philippi, they were not friendly competitions. They were gladiatorial events where the losing team lost life or limb. So while this word striving together has the idea of, of uh, it's, it's an athletic word, the thought behind it is that this is a life and death struggle. And when you are in that kind of battle, your teammates, those beside you, your brothers and your sisters, they become so important. The picture is a team working side by side for one goal, for one purpose, striving together. What for? For the faith of the gospel at the end of verse 27. What's the goal? The faith of the gospel. It's the truth of the gospel as recorded in Scripture. It's the same idea that Jude had when he wrote to the believers there appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the states, uh, saints. We are striving together for the faith, for the truth of the gospel. We are upholding the word of God. That's our third point. Our final point this morning is suffering, is suffering. You remember the story of when Paul got saved on the road to Damascus. God sent a disciple named Ananias to lay hands on Paul so that he could regain his sight. Ananias, when he was uh, told by God to go lay hands on Paul, he was rightly concerned. I mean, Paul had come to Damascus to persecute the Christians. But God said to him, go, Paul is mine. He's going to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. And Acts 9.16 says, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. And that is exactly what happened. Um, 2 Corinthians talks about, uh, 2 Corinthians is Paul's autobiographical book. And in that, he details the suffering that he endured for Christ, for the sake of the gospel. 2 Corinthians um, 11, verse 23 says this. Far more imprisonments. Paul's talking about what he's endured. Far more imprisonments. Beaten times without number. Often in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have spent in the deep. I have been on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Apart from such external things, there is the daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. That is what Paul endured for the gospel. That is what he suffered. Do we sometimes wonder, am I really suffering? I mean, I can't, I can't uh, understand that. I've never experienced that. I've never been stoned. I've never received lashes. I've never been shipwrecked. But friends, suffering 
persecution takes a number of forms. In the book of Acts, let me remind you just of a few. In Acts chapter 2, verse 13, remember at, the, at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came on the disciples and they were speaking in tongues and people that were in Jerusalem were hearing their language spoken by these uneducated, these Gentile, these uh, Galilean fishermen. And they were like, what in the world is going on? How are they doing this? And some of the people mocked them. That's what, those word, that's what the verse says. They would mock them. They said they're drunk on new wine. Um, in Acts 13, 45, the Jews were uh, jealous of Paul and his ministry, and they were mocking them. They were ridiculing them because huge crowds were coming. Ridicule, insults, sneering, mocking to the face, uh, laughing at you behind your back. Maybe you've experienced these insert insults. Uh, the rolling of the eyes at work when you walk through the room. There goes that Christian. There goes that Jesus follower, that lover, may, lover of Christ. Maybe you've experienced that. Uh, we see mocking on TV, on podcasts, on newscasts, people mocking believers for believing in creation that God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh. Persecution takes that form. So the second way that persecution takes in the book of Acts is false accusations. In Acts chapter 6, Stephen was falsely accused. The Jews secretly persuaded men to say lies about him. They had false witnesses say more lies about what he taught. People will lie about you because you follow Jesus. They will falsely accuse you. Also, there, the third way that we see persecution and suffering in the book of Acts is from threats of violence. Acts 4.21 says, after threatening them, they release them. Talking about Peter and John. Have you been threatened? I know that some of you have. I know that some of you have been threatened with physical violence. In the schemes, I know several people who have had bricks thrown through their windows because they preach the gospel. Lastly, in the book of Acts, we see suffering and persecution through attempts at compromise. In Acts 15, 1 to 2, uh, false converts came to the church in Antioch and were trying to get people to be circumcised, saying they had to be circumcised in order to be saved. They were preaching a false gospel. They were trying to get the believers there to compromise it was right here at First Baptist Roosevelt in 2018 when it was much like it is now. It was extremely dry, and we were praying for rain. It was called on the whole city to pray for rain. And there was even a huge event at Jones Stadium called Pray Lubbock. And we chose as leadership not to be a part of that because they had invited a Catholic priest to be up on the stage and to speak. And we said, we, you know what we did. We would have Reformation parties here at Roosevelt often, and we'd talk about the Reformation and what that meant historically. And we could not in good conscience go to Jones Stadium where uh, Bible-believing pastors, unfortunately, were holding hands with a Catholic priest saying, we're brothers in Christ. We couldn't be a part of that. We couldn't in good conscience say that. And I remember specifically talking to a lady about that, say, because she knew I was a believer. Y'all are going to be a part of Pray Lubbock at Jones Stadium, aren't you? No, we're not. Weirdo, you know, what, do you, what is that church out there? Roosevelt, why are y'all so weird like that? But no, we're going to take a stand for the truth. Even today, in Baptist circles, there's a compromise. There is a sliding that we can't go along with oftentimes. If you've suffered in any of these ways that we've been looking at, I want to encourage you this morning with Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6, verse 22, is what it says. Luke 6, 22 says this, Blessed are you when men hate you and ostracize you and insult you and scorn your name as evil for the sake of of the Son of Man. Be glad in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way their fathers used to treat the prophets, 
for in the same way their fathers used to te- treat the prophets. So don't be frightened when suffering, when persecution, and when opposition comes. Back in Philippians chapter 1. Why? Verse 28. In no way alarmed by your opponents. Don't be frightened. When people mock us, who are they really mocking? Keep going. In no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you, and that too from God. Don't worry when people mock. They're really mocking Jesus. And mocking of Jesus, as it says right there, results in destruction. Be encouraged because it is a sign of salvation for you and that too from God. The very next word for connects the two. It says, for to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. We have been called to suffer. In fact, uses the word granted. That's the, that's the word charis. That's the word for grace. We have been graced to suffer for his sake. It's a wonderful word. word. We sing about God's amazing grace. We love to talk about God's saving grace. We memorized Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, for by grace you've been saved through faith, not of yourself, as a gift of God. But we look but look at what else we get by grace. We get suffering. It has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. Also consider the fellowship of suffering. Look at verse 30. Experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. Consider the fellowship we have in suffering with Christ. We join Paul. We join the Philippians. We join all the believers who have suffered through the ages. That's our last point, to suffer for the gospel. We've been called on to live as citizens of heaven. We've been called on to live in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ by standing firm, by being of one spirit with one mind, by being unified, by striving together, and by suffering. I started off talking about the strange words I hear as I'm walking around Glasgow. As I walk around Glasgow and I talk to people, they instantly know that I'm not from around there. And they ask, where are you from? Now here's the question, and here is the challenge for us today. As we meet people, as we talk with people, as we interact with people wherever it is, in Glasgow, in Lubbock, wherever we are, as we talk with people at work, at school, in the neighborhood, wherever we go, How long does it take people to know that we are citizens of heaven? How long does it take people to know that? Another way to ask the question is this. Are we living our lives worthy of the gospel of Christ? May God help us stand firm. May God help us to be unified. May God help us to be striving together. May God help us to suffer for Christ. May God help us to live as citizens for heaven living lives worthy of the gospel of Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time that we've had in your word this morning. Again, we're just so amazed that you would be gracious to us, that you, in your mercy, would save sinners like us. Just amazed at your love for sinners, that you would send your son, your one and only son, Jesus, to come, to live a perfect life, to live the life that we could never live, to die on the cross, to take our penalty on himself, bearing your wrath for us on the tree. Thank you so much for that amazing truth and for granting us Christ's righteousness so that when you look at us, you see the righteousness of Christ. Lord, I just pray that if there are any here today that don't know you, that today would be the day that they would be saved, that they would turn to Jesus, that they would follow him, that they would turn from their sin and love and follow Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.